Hello. Uh, hey Ben, can you hear me? I can. I can. Can you hear me? I can indeed. How are you? I am okay. Sorry, I was a bit we, confused there. We got yeah, there. it feels like <laughs> our work is done, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's over now. <laughs> Merrily go on our separate ways. <laughs> meeting hey thank you for doing this man it's uh it's really good okay. to have you sounds like you're doing a deep dive into talk talk uh it just it, it, it's it, weirdly it weirdly just happened like that it was just oh, like okay. a kind of the week kind of i had phil and everything kind of lined up everyone everything lined up and then i noticed it was like the 40th anniversary i'm like oh man i look like i'm doing i'm some insane dude but it's just one of those things you know it was like uh you just, could but you could package it all up as a Although Tim would probably be really cross, wouldn't he? Yeah. He would, go to, he would uh, revert to, <laughs> to his default uh, emotion. Did you actually? Um, did you? You didn't get you. Did, uh, you kind of took bits and pieces from articles from Tim over yeah, the years. Yeah, I didn't get any. I mean, I approached him, and like yourself, um, I think it's. I think his partner, who was in City Beside, um, he she is lovely and, and and very personable, and I think she deals with inquiries. Mm-hmm. Or because they have a joint project, don't they? Or the short-haired cat, short-haired, short-haired, not short-haired cat. domestic. Yes, that's the one. That's the one. Short-haired yeah. domestic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, yeah, and and I because it, I very specifically said I, you know, I'm doing a book on talk talk. She said, oh, I don't think Tim is going to really want to talk about that. And I said, well, you might do because it's a book, and you know, I'm doing an actual biography. You know, maybe he'll make an exception for me. And she went, yeah. Everyone says that. <laughs> I um, the other night I was I didn't really um, I didn't bring up talk talk at all. It was him that brought it up. Wow. So, okay. So we I kind of let him. You know, I didn't want to. You know, because I respected him. He didn't really want to. You know, wasn't his opus or whatever to talk about talk talk. But he mentioned it, and I was like, I was like, hmm, okay. So we just kind of went from there. I guess I You know, I guess sometimes if people are too pushy on that it probably pisses them off yeah you know talking about that shit for 30 years you know would well i think he it sounds like he put he pulled up the drawbridge you know yeah almost almost 20 years ago now you know about six seven 18 years ago no 16 years ago you know around about mid 2000s yeah he just uh he just stopped yeah being being happy to to be interviewed about it after I think he did a Mojo interview with Jim Irvin. It's in the book anyway, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, he said I, quite I, a lot, and and he said quite a lot of things off the record as well, which I which I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There, there was um, yeah, it was an in, it's an interesting podcast. I must send it to you. He's a, he's a funny guy. It, he's yeah. a funny guy. He's very funny. You yes, know, I, I find it. I, I kind of. I mean, I probably said some ridiculous stuff. I, I told him I used to I play piano, and sometimes I mute the TV, and I was watching Bargain Hunt, and you know, the, I yeah, I always do that kind of thing of muting things, of uh, watching things or playing things. Yeah. So it's a kind of <laughs> it's just uh, <laughs> stupid shit. But anyways, but anyways, but um, did you write a book on sleeve designs? Because I remember vaguely yes. in a book. Ah, it was you. I remember like going through some book, maybe mm. last year in a in a bookshop, and it was like LP designs, and I was like. Hmm. When I seen your name, I was like, I think is that I wasn't sure. Yeah, art, art of the LP, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. About a decade ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it have like a reddish cover on it, or maybe? A... Yes. Okay, that definitely was. Yeah, <laughs> early editions, if you're lucky to get an early edition, have a, a plastic slip case that goes over it, oh, and then cool, there's all the little pack shots of the artwork underneath. It's very nice design, actually. It's good. Cool, design. cool, man. Um, how long back to the the lovely book because we're here talking about your book how long, Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, i'm such a tangent meister but um how long did it uh take you to actually write the book because it's a bit it's big like it's it's a big it is big it would know. have been i'm glad it's not bigger uh which it actually <laughs> was when i when i you know when i'd finished it i really had to kind of kill quite a lot of darlings uh, and my editor was was great mal um was 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 brilliant at rocket 88 because mm-hmm. and it, <laughs> I say in the acknowledgements, he was slightly terse with me. I said, "My, uh, yeah, it's along the lines of uh, my marvelously uh, opinionated editor, <laughs> who who uh, was refused to to give me any gushing praise. Actually, I, I needn't have even put the word gushing in. It was just he just didn't give me any praise at all. It was great. 
and consequently I, it was a better book you know because of because I think my initial draft was very I was very much in love with all of my research really so and I think that's kind of it's a real rookie mistake I'd never written a biography before okay. Okay. Um, I'd written the the, the the book on sleeve designs and I've written a a short a book of short stories and a novel and a book about music on the internet years ago for virgin and loads of obviously journalism and stuff but i've never written a biography so all of those interviews you put in the legwork and you kind of think i want to show this stuff all this all these people talking but actually a lot of it it's better um it, it, it's better just to paraphrase what someone said unless they've got a real you know beautiful nugget of uh they express it in a in a in a lovely way yeah um so yeah so that made it that made it a lot more manageable and hopefully readable um and the uh um and the, so the time it took me i got uh, i got commissioned just after lockdown which was a really nice timing um because Perfect. yeah the journal there was a magazine i was writing for that folded very very quickly called long live vinyl uh, after oh after lockdown um so that kind of uh that little avenue of income and pleasure um closed and and then this one opened and it was great um mal asked me to do it because interestingly we he and i did that artwork book together years ago and i wanted to include uh, spirit of eden and he <laughs> i shouldn't be saying this because it's kind of undermining but he was he was flat out no it's crap i don't like it <laughs> You know he's very he's so opinionated i love it you know i'm i'm supposed to be the opinionated one having done a and r you know yeah. i'm, I'm be the one who's uh who's uh you know makes make sweeping sweeping uh dismissals of things but he was um yeah he was quite reluctant to put that which is ironic because obviously the same publisher then went and did a very successful book called the spirit of talk talk which is largely james marsh's fabulous i was in, i was in that book one of my quotes Oh, great. Which okay. I'm, nice I'm kind of embarrassed about it. I was like, oh, no, I sound like I'm trying to <laughs> give a quote. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, fuck. I kind of, I mean, I was honest about it, but it was like, oh, Jesus. I must look you up. Oh, that's great. I, 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 think, would, um... I think I'm close to, um, oh, Jesus Christ, my brain isn't working. I think I'm close to Robert Plant, that area. Of okay, the book, nice. Maybe, but I haven't read it in years since it came out. It was like, it's an odd, it's an odd thing, isn't it? It's a, it's a curate's egg of a book. And I think it was born out of an original idea by Toby Benjamin to do a mm -hmm. book of Marsh's, of, of Marsh's talk talk stuff, which I think he was doing. He had some kind of merchandise, uh, um, relationship with, and then it became, he had this idea to interview, people who've been involved with talk talk and then there was the people who like talk talk and it, that kind of came out of it and that's why to kind of get it back to my book that's why mal you know thought well there's there's mileage in doing a biography um, you know obviously after hollis died in, in in 2019 yeah and he knew remembered that i had you know i was quite vehemently a fan um and so yeah he, he offered me the job it was a i think it was a you know even the after all that we published it and it sold really well you know the publisher said you know what it was a tough gig ben it was a tough and it was because a lot of people as you know we've just been talking about tim freeze green um a lot of people just were sticking to keeping stum and mm. you know in their words respecting um his widow and uh and his and his son's privacy which i can totally understand um, but at the same time, I wasn't setting out to write a book about, you know, what Mark Hollis had for breakfast and, <laughs> and whether he favoured, you know, jockey or Calvin Klein underwear. You know, it was it was it was about his his music and his and his approach to it. So I think once that. Yeah, I mean, there were a few people who were initially reluctant who then came round, which was lovely. Sadly, Tim Freeze Green wasn't one of them. And, and nor I was quite actually quite surprised were. Um, um what 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 Paul Webb um or um Lee oh my god Lee Harris or Lee yeah so Lee and Lee and Paul are very close to a friend of mine um Kelly Callaman who who did their Orang record for them and 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 then kept in touch and also was in touch with Hollis and the whole Hollis thing by doing uh the artwork and the kind of design um uh, overview on all the re-releases for EMI with with mm. Nigel Reeve there and um they just you know they wanted to maintain that that the, the silence for the for the sake of well 
in their words, for the you know to respect the, the privacy of the of Flick, um, Mark's widow. So that said, I think if I had got into, I mean, this is, maybe this is a ridiculous thing to say, but if I had got interviews with them, the book possibly would have been more complex and even longer. Maybe it would have been better for that, possibly, but it would have been, yeah, uh, there would have been perhaps more stuff to navigate and, and possibly contradictory stuff and yeah. yeah but that said you know if they were if they were to email me tomorrow and offer up interviews of course i would you know there's, there's going to be i mean we're doing a third edition of the pay, of the hardback i think because the first two sold out and they're doing and then the paperback I th originally i think was the end of this year but maybe postponed until next year that's great off the uh, yeah so it's you know it's selling really well which is great and you know um i'm sure the publishers with their with their um marketing heads on are thinking well if we can you know <laughs> we can get a whole bunch of fresh interviews then we can market it as a, you know second edition and people will go and buy it all over again yeah i'll be it from me to recommend that <laughs> it was good you got phil phil's like hmm. uh, uh, you know, me and phil were talking about the book and we were saying how much yeah. we liked it the other night and mm -hmm. uh what you get in the the in the book is you kind of seen how Mark kind of was with people. He would kind of befriend them, and the, but they always be, would be at a difference, uh, not a difference, at a at distance. A distance yeah, and yes. then he'd kind of just go, "All right, bye," and then I never <laughs> seen them again. It was <laughs> it was so yeah. it, was, it was like uh, I'm not going to say the word he used people, but there was a certain kind of like he reached a point with people and then that was kind of it. He was like, okay, I'm fine. Go on, move on to the next thing, which is kind of odd for me. Like I'm very much like friend to like, yeah, well, kind I think of most, I think, yeah, most people are. I think most people maybe would like the, the, maybe the ability to just skip to the cut to the chase or skip to the end or get to the, get to the meat and potatoes, whatever, you know, analogy you want to use. But, but Mark, was able to do that you know he was able just to kind of see almost kind of see truths and see the main yeah. the, the main point of things very quickly and get to that without kind of having to deal with sometimes having to deal with people's uh sensitivity or you know or, or be empathetic really to them um yeah yeah but then when you listen to those records you're kind of like they're made by a guy who thinks in his own singular way you know they're a very singular esque record, especially Spirit and and Laughing Stock. You know, mm. like how many bands after them have tried to sound like Talk Talk, and they just sound like derivatives of Talk. You know, like I've I heard some band the other day. I know what the, they made some album. I don't know who what's her name, but it was on Spotify, and I was like, yeah, it sounds good, but it just sounds like you've ripped off all the things of Talk Talk, and it just I was like, nah, man, and it got great reviews and stuff, and I was like, no. Nah. I'm not feeling that like he's you know it's it's interesting I think I mean I didn't say this in the book but I think on reflection the more I you know because I'm still listening to them I still can't stop putting on their records Me you know um, <laughs> and the, 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 his whole Mark's whole um, argument that he was playing in a jazz quartet you know which was which seemed so misplaced during the you know, parties over period and the, and uh, and it's my life yeah i think he's i mean aside from the obvious you know more jazz influenced um uh, music on the latter albums the key to that comparison or the key to that vision he had kind of ties into his desire to do something which doesn't which isn't tied to the time in which it was recorded or written or conceived yeah you know, so he on several occasions and again this is in the book he he says that the goal is to is to is to come out with something that no one can put a date on you know no one can say well that's from that period or and which he of clearly i mean he said didn't succeed with, with, with the earlier records of course but those but the but the ones that he's talking about the final three including yeah. his solo album most he most certainly did and the key to that i think is his voice if he had a voice or he, if he used his voice in a different way, um, or perhaps if he continued using his voice in the way that he was using it in the earlier uh, records, mm. then we would have been able to... Yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an 80s record, you know. He's got that either strident chest-beating thing going on, you know, that was so fashionable back in the in those days, in those sort of U2 
simple minds sort of chest beating histrionic um celtic rock days and you know or or, or whether it was uh inspired by whatever else was going on at the time in the in the late 80s you know maybe if he'd been listening to um all of the all of the bands that people wanted him to listen to in the early 90s like all of the shoegazing bands and my bloody valentine and, uh, and all of that then he would have had perhaps more inspiration not to not to say that tim freeze green possibly would have brought a little bit of his experience of lush and and uh catherine wheel and the, and the things that he had been producing yeah. into the into the laughing stock production but um the fact that mark kind of approached his vocals almost like another instrument mm, i think mm. is crucial to the, 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 the how, how unique they sound does that make any sense yeah oh no i totally get you Cause even on the when you hear the early records he has a voice of uh, i'm not gonna say but 80s but you go oh he's got that 80s kind of voice and mm. then when you hear him on the later records he still has the same voice but he's essentially yes. using it in a different way that doesn't make yes. it sound like you know what I mean? It's it's got yeah, that. absolutely, yeah. He's using it tonally in a in, in a in a much more controlled and subtle and you know and obviously he's giving him he's giving himself space to just you know almost breathe into the microphone because yeah. there's virtually nothing else instrumentally going on around the voice. Uh, and in that respect, you know, he's it's totally comparable with with the you know the the John Coltrane. Yeah, 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 yeah. Banged on about so much. Yeah, it was funny uh, when I was talking to Phil the other, other night. I said to him, I was listening. You know, I went back and listened to a lot of their stuff as well, and I was listening to his solo record. And I said to him, I was like, I was like, is his head? Did you? How did you mic that? Because it sounds like he's kind of moving over sometimes. And he said, Oh yeah, we kind of mic'd it like there was two mics. I'm probably going to get this wrong, but like the 50s style and Mark kind of would sit down, but he said sometimes he had the habit of moving his head and I was like, okay, my hearing isn't fucked again. Because it would sometimes (laughs) slightly drift, you know, kind of that kind of things. And, yeah, you know, there's not many people would kind of be like, okay, let's mic like that. They just do, you know, like a mono mic, and you'd hear everything down the middle. But you know, his yeah. he, he just wants to be authentic to what he was recording, which is such a cool kind of thing. It, it was like those records sound perfect, even though they're probably not perfectly done in the way of like you know you would always record like modernly, even in that type of just mm. thing. Mm. But but. I don't know. I think those. I think those records are perfect for me. Even though he said he didn't like things sounding overproduced, I remember like they kind of, what was it? They degraded something, and even when they degraded it, it still sounded, you know, brilliantly <laughs> perfect. And yeah, but perfect. I don't mean perfect in that kind of uber produced. You know that shitty kind of produced, like those eighties records. Yes, just, I know it, absolutely. Everything yeah. just has Not this. Polished. Yes. Polished. Yeah, yeah. Everything has this perfectly sonic. Everything sonically perfectly balanced with each other like i still think, well, I think it was just it was room ambience wasn't it that's yeah on that last, yeah on that last record that's what that's what he wanted and that's what he you know he'd already spent a couple of hundred grand on it with you <sighs> and, um, and then discovered that warren lives had close mic'd some some of the instruments as a as an insurance and and that and, and those bits had been used in the uh in the rough mixes so they went back and redid everything with phil it sounded like they were going to just do a few bits and bobs. <laughs> yeah. you know, they went back and they read all the drums, which had been done by, you know, um, Steve, Steve Gadd, Gadd yeah. and Vince Pugliette, you know, who, who, who were <laughs> the two sort of most in-demand session drummers in the world. You know. Crazy. I love that. That's my favourite quote in the book. Um, Daniel, um, um, what's his name? Dominic Miller, the guitarist who plays on that record and, uh, it was Sting's guitarist who knew he'd worked with Steve Gadd, I think, with the with, with Sting, and he and he, you know, he said, "Why, why did, why did you just go back to using Martin Ditchham on the drums? He had Steve Gadd, and he said he didn't like his feel. Didn't like his feel. He fucking invented feel." <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Uh, that is it's such a Mark Hollis thing to go ah don't need yeah. to get Phil you get Steve Gadd off this one's just like fucking crazy but like those I think Talk Talk as much and all as that, and in the book I kind of never it never really dawned to me but in the book it almost it, what you were saying it was like it's like Talk Talk was kind of built around him you know like the, it was him he got signed to it was EMI and then they kind of got the other lads to play well he, he signed to Island Music Island yeah she? sorry yeah 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 oh, yeah, yeah. And then it was kind of like built around them. And then for me, Talk Talk, as much and all, it is Mark. Those records, 
are not just him. They're like Tim and Phil and, you know, mm. the, it, without all those guys, they wouldn't have been as good for me. Even though musically they're still brilliant, but, the, you know, it's the sum of the it's parts. It's very true. It's very true. I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, you know, in some respects, it's a great shame. Uh, and it's maybe it's a good thing that, that Lee and Paul don't do interviews because they might be, you know, feeling a little bit hard done by because they're not. Yeah, it's all about Mark, isn't it? We're at, but when you think about it, Lee is a fantastic drummer and actually is a rhythm section. You know, they'd already played in Escalator. The Scar Band, you know, in, in Essex. See what they did with that name? Very clever. <laughs> I see that. Clever Scar Band. Um, but they, you know, they were really tight. And I think that Scar, it's funny, talking to Callie, he pointed this out because not only is Callie sort of, it, you know, he's a he's very um, talented and gifted uh, um, art um, artist, you know, who, who does artwork and mm -hmm. puts together visual campaigns. I mean, I, but I met him as uh, when we were both doing A&R together in the late 80s. I think I may have mentioned that in the, possibly in, in, at the end of the book. But he, he pointed out to me, and which I think he's absolutely right, is Paul's bass playing is really um, syncopated. Yeah. You know, he's almost got, because he's not trained in any way. He's got, and he was quite slow, with, you know, coming up with bass lines. But the bass lines he did come up with were always really brilliant and original and interesting and quite often it's because he's playing on the offbeat in a kind of reggae scar way and if you go back and listen to those records it's absolutely crucial to the sound you know his yeah. his, his style of bass playing and i think it's a shame you know even as far back as it's my life hollis you know got in a session bass player for one of the tracks you know got in um mike oldfield session bass player you know and and, and certainly by spirit of eden you know you had you, you, you had danny thompson turning up and you know so he must have felt pretty bad you know when he was coming in with his bass lines and and tim and and mark were saying nah don't like that can you do it again he'd have to go away for a week yeah. come up with something else and you know meanwhile there's session musicians coming in so you know it's no wonder he decided he'd had enough and and didn't go on to do laughing stock yeah and then paul and lee but likewise you know was put through as I'm sure you know, you read in the book. And during Laughing Stock, there was a period where he was asked to play. Uh, I think it was a song that never Phil had the kind of working title of it, and I could never quite link the working title with the song because it was called. It's called in his book. He calls it Sway a Swabi, S W A B I, and there's, and it was a song they worked on for ages and ages but n it never ended up on the album and i think it might be one of the songs one of the tracks that was put on uh one of the three eps that got released off laughing stock when they right. tried to market it right. um, um but anyway he he was in doing that he kind of went he had to do this drum part again and again and again without any real guidance as to why he was doing it <laughs> yeah um and it sounds, yeah, it just sounds like absolutely like torture. I don't know. There's a show, thinking of it now, because I was watching it last night. There's a show on Apple TV called Severance at the moment. I don't know whether you've heard no, of it or seen it. No. But it's a well, without going into irrelevant detail, there's a bit in it where if you're at the, if you do something bad in this office where you work, you have to read this apology. Oh. Go into a room called the break room and there's a and there's an apology almost like a sort of uh, liturgical text written on a piece of glass and you have to read it to your manager to your to this senior manager guy who's got headphones on but you have to mean it okay so, you know, and it's kind of like reading it and then he'll shake his head and go no you have to say it like you mean it oh, and don't shit. But, you know that kind of and then that's obviously two extremes and that's obviously not quite the torture that Lee was going through, but it, you know, to be asked to play something again and again and again, yeah, without actually knowing what he's doing wrong. Um, you know, and he said to Callie later, I mean, I, as I say, I said earlier, you know, I didn't interview um, Lee myself, but Callie told me that he, by the end of it, he thought he was hallucinating. <laughs> he actually got quite ill and, and had to take, you know, a sabbatical. Yeah. Off yeah. The, recording during the during the sessions because it was just brutal it's like it was kind of like that that was for me <laughs> you know you always want the people you admire to be lovely people you really you really that's in mark wasn't a lovely person but 
there was an mm. aspect of him that was very bullyish and kind of you know could be rather awful to like the guys in the band and people outside the band and that was a that was a kind of hard thing to read but like it was it was good because you know you weren't trying to like say oh this dude's an angel and he may because no one's an angel like that's the reality of life isn't it but um that was that was that was i found difficult because you're like oh shit man he was shitty yeah. you know you're kind of like oh man mark what do you because he made this beautiful music I mean, well, they all did, or, you know, like, but, but, yeah. you know, it's such serene, beautiful music. So you're thinking it's made in that, but that is not the truth of it. You know, no, did you, did you no. find, did you find that hard to kind of, you know, that you're like, fuck man, that guy could well, be a bit of a I bully. kind of, I mean, I got the impression, I think it wasn't surprising to me. I mean, some of the thing, you know, like, again, I, I, I seem to be quoting Callie quite a lot in this interview, but one thing Callie told me in the same conversation he had with uh, with Lee about that, mm. about the recording of Spirit of Eden, you know, he said, this is just, this album is so beautiful and it just sounds like an idyllic, beautiful <laughs> set, you know, scene, the pastoral, the, you know, yes. the, that kind of beauty, that, that magic time when the sun is just going down in summer. And uh, and Lee just shook his head and went, "No, it was, it was just World War Three <laughs> in the uh, in the studio." Yeah. And there were, you know, there was a lot of one day someone's favourite, next day they're, you know, that they're they're being slightly, you know, bullied, and you know, and who's who's going to be the the butt of the joke today? And there's so everyone was kind of on tenter hooks as to. Uh, as the you know the power play going on in the studio it doesn't it does not sound like a fun time no. but interest you know but all of those recordings and the way that session musicians were thrown in the dark literally to play whatever they wanted and then bits of what they played was was kind of stitched together incredible as phil said you know phil says it sounds like it's four guys in a room yeah playing beautiful music and that's the it's the opposite of that it's just the whole bunch of of uh, you know they're using they're using that mitsubishi like a like a sampler really you know they're taking they're taking all the little bits and assembling it in a in, in a in the fragments into a whole yeah um but yeah but equally you know going back to what you're saying about mark maybe you know lacking empathy and and and, and having that tendency sometimes tendency to, towards bullying I had an equal in a number of people who said he was incredibly loyal and yeah, good company yeah. and great humour and, and um, you know, just fun to be around. So he wasn't, I think, you know, some people kind of found it tempting to fall into an easy categorization of him as being some, somehow on the spectrum or sort of, uh, you know, mildly, you know, some kind of dif difficulty with... Um, relating to people and i'm not sure that's the case right. you know i really i don't think it's as cut and dried as that there may well have been something there you know you know some people whose opinions i really respect mm -hmm. were, were quite categorical about that but i just i think if he was you know fully if it was all about that then he would not have been able to sustain the relationships that he did and certainly wouldn't been able to sustain the the, the, the close relationship with his family and the, yeah and yeah yeah family as well um yeah and and you know like i say i mean talking to uh mark felton the harmonica player who, who worked with him that's great you know repeatedly from from uh the color of spring he, he absolutely loves him you know he's one of the top five people in his entire life that that uh so yeah you know there's no there's there's no definitive view on on Hollis from the book, and I'm glad that you thought it was a you know the, a balance there. Yeah, and it's interesting. Some people, you know, Wyndham Wallace, uh, who's who appears in the book because he kind of tried to get Mark some uh, some soundtrack work in Berlin. That was super like, interesting. That whole section, I never yeah. knew any of that, like the Marie Antoinette oh. stuff. I was like, whoa, man, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. was like, whoa, but Wyndham, man, but Wyndham he writes for a magazine called classic rock and, and he did a, he did a piece on, on the book and a, you know, a big Hollis feature. And he was very in the, you know, his takeaway from the book was what a horrible person Mark was, which is fascinating. <laughs> you know, that was his takeaway. And equally some people, their takeaway is being what a lovely guy. So it's kind of, I'm glad that there's, you know, you can, you can take either 
I think police. it's I think it's both though, isn't it? You know, like sometimes the people like Talcock in in essence with Tim and all them like like sometimes the people you can be the most shitty to are the people you know the best, like your family. You know, mm. because you're mm. almost comfortable in like saying something shitty and you feel bad about it, but you can st- you know what I mean? Whereas if some stranger yeah. You're not, you know, you have your manners up or something like that. But like, sometimes you'll say stuff and you're like, oh shit, I shouldn't have said that. But you've said it because you have that comfortableness of with your family. And I don't know, I'm not yeah. trying to psycho Freud him or anything <laughs> like that. But you know, <laughs> maybe that yeah. was it. I don't know. I don't know. But ever like, I, I look at it like, you know, we're all like complex in our own little way or we're not complex at all. But it, people are can be cruel and lovely and awful and beautiful at the same time and so it's just aspects of people I guess but what I meant to say to you about it, it, with the book which surprised me and then on, on hindsight it kind of didn't surprise me but mm. um, the reviews of Talk Talk especially like even like some getting bad reviews on the colour of spring you know like like I mean the yeah. enemy are notorious for just being shitheads anyways but like it's always that hindsight thing of like you'll see these magazines like they'll say really awful things about bands and then 10 years later they'll give them a 10 you know like 10 star review and like mm-hmm. uh, do you think that stuff had any effect on mark the, the yes i do of... yeah i think he was he, he very quickly um he gave up on ever being taken seriously in in the uk certainly through the until he got to the uh, spirit of eden period yeah. But certainly on the first three albums, I mean, he, you know, the, the the third album, obviously, finally they started having some some success in the UK. But even during that, he in in the press pieces, he was not taking the interview seriously. And there's some really telling, there's some telling ones, you know, where mm. he, in the same week, he's doing an interview and he's asked a question by. Uh, I don't know, a, 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 I think it was a musician's magazine, one of these, there used to be special musician's magazines that were free, that were, there used to be piles of them in rehearsal rooms and studios wow. when, I, when I used to, when I used to frequent those places as an A&R person. And the, um, the interviewer was, you know, really trying hard to do a serious interview with Mark about how he got, you know, the sound on, um, it's getting late in the evening, and, or, 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 you know, the, the, uh, um, the mic sound that they used, and he was just not, and you know, and I think that he got asked about Tim Freeze Green. He said, "So, how do you work with Tim Freeze Green? You know, what's your relationship like?" And instead of sort of using that as a as a um, uh, a, a, a forum for addressing, you know, how he made his records, he just went, "Oh, well, he's the most boring man I think I've ever <laughs> met. I, mean, I think probably, yeah, he's probably is." The, and he just went off on a kind of. You know, Derek and Clive, Peter Cook style monologue yeah. about how boring Tim Free Screen was. A week later, he's asked the same question by a Dutch magazine, and it, he gives the most eloquent, incisive answer. So I just think he couldn't be asked in the UK, <laughs> given he, he, he gave up on it. And I think it kind of it started coming around a little bit when Danny Kelly. Um, Danny Kelly wrote some nice things in the. Uh, in the enemy after the enemy had kind of panned him but it just it didn't really help you know there was only actually one writer throughout their career who was who was consistently positive and that was a writer called betty page um well that was her that was her kind of nom de plume uh but she, she was always complimentary and he yeah he always kind of agreed to interviews with her and it's ironic you know he was doing interviews with her right until the very end it's kind of very much an unsung journalistic hero i think of the of the talk talk story oh that's that's super cool i actually it's funny i was telling phil the other night and i'm not i'm not because you know the way our brains are kind of odd i'm not sure about anyways i i (laughs) when you said that um uh, mark used to go to the west of ireland all the time thinking holy shit man i'm from the west of ireland and then um or live in the west of ireland as well and i'm from Mm. there but um then you said about he went to Electric Picnic in 2011 I'm, I'm like man I played that year and I remember walking around and seeing a guy he was like oh that guy looks like Mark Hollis or that's Mark <laughs> Hollis and then thinking in my brain what the fuck yeah. would Mark Hollis be doing somewhere with a load of people it's Electric Picnic of course that's not Mark Hollis How you know and, I, and when I seen that it kind of clicked and I'm thinking did I think that or have I is that a, you know what I mean you can never <laughs> be fully yeah. yes you can never be fully sure about that kind of thing because the minute I read it I had that thought and I was like, holy shit, man. 
I was like, just, yeah, yeah. I was like, and I was like, who were, who were you? So just I know a bit of a, it's a bit of a tangent, but who were you playing with that year then? That what was, was just, that was just me playing. Uh, you know, I was just had a slot myself, and I had oh, nice guys, one. Oh, yeah, okay. I had guys playing with me, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was kind of, and when you said about Beirut, and I was like, holy shit, man! I was going around that. It was kind of <laughs> around that kind of stage and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they like, were. I think they were on the same stage. Um, as Big Audio Dynamite a little bit a little bit later, which is possibly why he was there. I think in the book I mentioned that there was another stage with a lot of quite interesting cutting edge music. That yeah, arguably would have been of more appeal to him. But um, you know, rather than Big Audio Dynamite, it's a little bit kind of looking backwards for someone who was so sort of progressive. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he did. It's funny. There's a there was a friend of mine who has a. Um, he used to manage bands back in the 90s. Um, uh, he managed a band called Whipping Boy. I don't know whether you remember Oh, them. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Whipping Boy, yeah. Come but on. he went on to be quite successful in doing merchandise uh, in in um, in Ireland. So for, you know, pop bands playing in Ireland, he, he kind of got the sort of various merchandise concessions. And I still know him. And he did it. He organized yeah, an event a couple of years ago that, that I that I kind of uh, did into various interviews. I, I was interviewing others uh, at it um, called Vinyl Dublin. Um, but his brother uh, became quite friendly with Mark Hollis. And actually, wow. he was one of the first person that I approached and said, listen, would you know, would your brother be? up for an interview and he said well probably you know he'd have to you'd have to get permission from flick for him to talk to you and i, and I just at that point i just thought i, I don't want to push the push this because i'm not yeah. clearly i mean i have subsequently after i finished the book i sent flick a card and and, and she sent me a, a very nice response saying i'm actually i don't worry about sending me a book it's too still too raw for me to yeah, yeah. read anything about it but she was certainly you know i was pleased not to get a cease and desist uh, <laughs> letter from a lawyer or something like that so that was a night you know i took that as a as a positive getting a nice kind of uh, a nice card from her but um yeah i would have loved to have spoken to to this the this irish um um friend of of hollis because i think they you know their families knew one another and and i think that was why he was regularly going to the west of ireland because you know they were they were like family friends and Wow. The kids had grown up together, and and presumably, you know, he loved nature, and and he would have, you know, he would have been out in the, away from away from it all, and and um and and the probably would have been a fair amount of peace, peace, quiet, and arguably silence. Well, wow. I'm sure he was surfing. I can imagine Mark was down here surfing. <laughs> I was just even shocked the guy was playing golf. I was like, ha! Huh? It's just like yeah. Mark Hollis is playing golf. That would be another. Yeah, that would be another blow to the, you know, to, the, to to people who kind of picture this man in a in a small room, never going out. You know, after after I learned that he was a golf player, he liked racing or he liked driving fast in Ducati on Ducati yes. motorbikes, and uh, and also, frankly, was a bit of a petrol head. You know, he liked to drive swiftly around London. I think that's the one the one thing where he was uh, he was similar to his brother. Yeah. Um, his brother was an interesting character. I knew nothing about that till your book. I was like, "Whoa, that guy's super!" Like, totally polar opposite of him. You know, like yes, just yes. You could tell the kind of ki- type of guy he was. I'm thinking, I met loads of dudes like that. Great yeah. crack when you're out. Maybe not for living with, but great crack you when you're. Out. Spend, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't <laughs> want to be married to them. Perhaps. Exactly. Yeah, but uh, that was that was very interesting because I think. I think that told a lot about his personality, like, mm-hmm. you know, not outwardly, but, you know, you can I'm glad you say that because, I, you know, I did feel that was one of my dilemmas, really, because uh, ostensibly Ed Hollis is a is a much more interesting character than Mark because he kind of was more personable. He knew more people. He spoke to more people. More people had, you know, an insight into his character. Mm-hmm. And he did have he did have again superficially a much more um easily understandable character but then again did he you know i mean he's as you say the polar opposite of mark Mm. and maybe what was feeding his exuberance that led virtually everyone i spoke to who knew him to describe him as a a, um a whirlwind or a force (laughs) of nature or a hurricane you know all of the all of these kind of natural phenomenon words were employed to describe him (laughs) you know what was fueling that was it the same thing that was fueling Mark's desire to to not be to to, to be the opposite of all that, you know, to do yeah. to be 
on his own and be quiet and be and be contemplative and 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 um, and uh, and be uh, measured and and and, uh, and and not excessive. Yeah, yeah, it was it was uh, it was interesting. It was like it's like I never knew I never knew he had a brother. You know, you know, like a certain things you kind of go. Oh, I never thought about that, and I never looked into yeah. that. I'm well, glad I brothers. didn't. Yeah, two, two brothers. brothers too. Yeah, and, and I got I reached a number of dead ends on on his younger brother Paul, um, who I, I I I got to a point where I thought I tracked him down as someone who taught martial arts in Brighton, because there were various pictures of a man who was around the right age called Paul Hollis, and who I think had the same year of birth in a. On, on various ancestry websites in in terms of residency in Brighton as well. But I just, I reached dead ends at the, you know, the martial arts school couldn't trace him and he disappeared, yeah. you know, so I don't, I imagine he's somewhere, he's still alive, you know, there's, and there's a number of, I think, members of the Hollis family, extended family and, and Flick's family who, who are still around who probably would know. Yeah. Um, is, Flick, yeah. is Flick her real name? Felicity. Is oh, a, is right. I was like, whoa, Flick. <laughs> yeah. I think it, she was called that from an early age, and, and I don't think many people used the full name. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it must have been hard for people, though, because like, you're interviewing people, and you know, you're trying to be true to him. His, you, you know, he, if they had a relationship with him, it's hard for them to kind of like, are they betraying him? And, you know, but they're just telling their side of the story, so they're not. Was that Was that quite hard for some people who kind of were like, shall i talk shall i not talk did you get the vibe from people that people were like willing to talk or how was that well, i mean as i say there were some people who were who, who were not willing to talk and didn't talk there were some people who who were not willing to talk and then they they heard some okay things about me or they or they in the case of the manager i think um keith aspton he was reluctant initially but then came around which was really really great but i think even he was wary of saying anything that was, or, or being recorded as having said anything that was too, that was maybe too negative about Mark, and I mm. think that was a, a desire. I think it was a desire to not um, upset um, Flick, but you know there may have been other you know other issues that, that, that relate to people not wanting to be negative about Mark. You know, did you I mean, meet? Did you meet Keith uh, in person, or was it over like uh, Zoom? Well, that was the other thing. Going back to the original. You know, the thing about lockdown is that the book took a, probably a year from beginning to end to write. And uh, I see I'm answering your first question an hour in now. Um, <laughs> I like it. Book took a year to write, and it was through lot. And but it was I was obviously working at the uni as well and doing lots of other things. So it wasn't a, it wasn't just every day I'd get up and interview people for the Hollis book. Hmm. Um, but it was easier that period because everyone was at home. So there was not a problem with interviewing a tour manager who had, you know, who'd been once, you know, been a, a roadie with Mark when he was a teenager because he wasn't on tour with the Divine Comedy. He was at the, all the gigs had been cancelled and he was at home and he and he was, you know, he could happily talk to me. And similarly, you know, everyone, all the session musicians that I spoke to were all at home as well and they weren't out on tour or in the studio or, or being distracted and busy and, and unable to talk to me so that actually helped but it did mean that I was not able at the time you know I could I could have maybe subsequently gone but I was not able to go to South End and tramp mm -hmm. those streets and I think I think I've conjured it up well enough for that period you know it may have been better if I if I'd gone there now but then I, I would have got a 21st century flavor of Rayleigh and and uh, and, and and South End and and maybe in my head, reading about it, looking at various pictures on Google Maps, looking at various uh, period photographs, enabled me to possibly do a more informed job. I'm, I might be reading too much into it, though. No, I think it paints a great picture. I think it's it's a great picture. Do you notice by, um, I don't know, is this just me, but when you listen mm. to Tim's solo records, you kind of realise how much of him was in the the records he worked definitely laughing stock, like that mm. kind of distorted you know especially those records he did with Hilo Gland Hilo Gland you know like that yeah, kind of yes. like even Heligo, Heligo Heligo Land, yeah. Hel oh, some terrible pronouncing those things yeah, but yeah, there's a, I think people kind of you know they 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 think a lot of those records were just all Mark and what we were saying earlier there's a lot of Tim in that and you know a lot of Phil and a lot of the other guys but like mm -hmm. I I think 
it it was it's and it seemed in your book back to my point that I'm making in my head that I haven't said yet. Uh, mm. <laughs> it seemed like Mark had to write with other people, like he could he yes. didn't really, which is so counterintuitively to who he is as a person that he likes is you know I there was a weird, that's a odd dichotomy of a of a person yeah. who like has to write with people but kind of it's like he doesn't really want to do it but he kind of has to do yeah. it. It's well, that's absolutely what Keith, you know, that's what Keith said, you know, that was the, in many ways, that was the great burden in his life was that he, he needed to collaborate because he wasn't the greatest of musicians or, or mm-hmm. you know, and, and couldn't, and, you know, do studio engineering or whatever. He needed to collaborate. And psychologically, I think he needed to collaborate right. right back to the reaction days when he's writing, you know, new wave songs with George Page and, and then later with Simon Brenner when they're, you know, writing with um, uh, Don Black, you know, the guy that, who wrote that was Thing That was Don interesting, Free. that whole Don Black, Don Black. It was, always, it, was, it was always collaboration, always collaboration. He would come up with ideas, but he needed a, he needed a foil. Even, you know, I, I mean, for me, the great unsung presence in talk talk is phil ramican yeah 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 who who effectively co-wrote such a shame never got a credit but but um you know that you know mark fishing out cassettes of the black plastic bag in hackney and <laughs> you know and with, the, with two melodies that were in different keys and he didn't know how to transpose them and he didn't know what to do as a middle eight or a bridge you know and phil's classical training mm. and and his and his natural kind of you know just I think I think uh, someone described him as just he kind of bled music, Phil. You know, he was absolutely not only classically trained, but also immensely naturally gifted. You know, and able uh, able to list to to play atonal sort of Bartok influenced um, Schoenberg Shostakovich style Sweet. piano, but also <laughs> able to do the arrangements for a Jimmy Cliff album or play with the Wailers. Or, yeah, you know what I mean. A huge talent. And uh, not recognised enough, you know, but um, yeah. So to back to for Tim Freeze Green, I think you know he was he t- to collaborate. His influence is hugely um, present on those on those rec- on the last two records, particularly, and and certainly in Laughing Stock in the book. You know, he, he he was in a much more. It was him and Phil that were saying, right, we don't want to do Spirit of Eden two. Yeah, and I think Phil's you know involvement with Lush and Catherine Will, as I say, you know, really. He upped the ante for that sort of discordant, very guitar-based record that uh, that, that Laughing Stock is. Yeah, Phil was saying he can listen to Spirit of Eden, but he couldn't listen to Laughing Stock. And he said that you were doing, I think it, I, I could get some, but it was like a and a and you put... He had a projector and it was like he played Laughing... Not Laughing Stock, he played Spirit of Eden. And I think, what was that like? That was from class. It was great. I did a yeah. I did a, a kind of book launch here in Stroud locally, um, um, and it was it was lovely, you know, because people came from all over the country, like a kind of pilgrimage. Wow. We have a great venue here with a really high end um, system, and there's a a company run by a colleague of mine called Lost Gain who who do immersive um, immersive evenings. Now, obviously, it's not it's not recorded in. 5.1 and it's not record it's not recorded for an immersive experience but nonetheless i just thought it would be great to hear spirit of eden after having had myself and phil talk a bit about hollis you know in the in this environment and then i thought as an afterthought i thought well why not get a, an oil projector and have that going <laughs> yeah what you know because i'm not going to do i'm not going to get some slideshow and show pictures of talk talk while we listen to the spirit <laughs> in that would be crass and i don't and we need something sort of there that's there that isn't that, that is helping the music. And it was brilliant. I mean, you know, looking at your lava lamp behind you there, Paul, it was. Oh, kind yes. Of <laughs> that device. That sort of, it's that thing writ large on a on a on a screen. Savage. And it worked. And it obviously the, the, the record was recorded because Lee found an old oil projector in the, <laughs> one of the rooms in Wessex. Or no, maybe he got it from the lockup. And they put it, that was the light, that was the only light they had in the control room at Wessex. And they and they spent nine months making Spirit of Eden with that as the only, you know, with that going round. And I think Phil once, I think it was on Spirit of Eden, he had a brilliant, he said, uh, why don't we mix, when we mix, <laughs> let's get the oil projector going anti-clockwise. <laughs> like, yeah, brilliant, that'll be good. 
but apparently they lasted like 10 minutes <laughs> felt so sick and disorientated they had to get it back to the club that's right. brilliant that's <laughs> brilliant man yeah it's 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 funny like uh when you were talking about your experience of when you were in the car and listened i think you were in a car and the sunset mm. kind of like came up and yeah. so many yeah. people including myself has that kind of time they you know I remember the first time I heard Spirit of Eden, like mm. not as a mm. whole, but the first time I heard it, I was like, what the fuck is that? When the rainbow, on the rainbow and that mm. guitar mm. and the harmonic and everything. Mm. There's that like, shit, man, you know, what is that? Oh, Everyone, isn't it? It's, yeah. It's like, it's like, um, it's like that, you know, that, I mean, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, but like the sex, the sex pistols at the hundred, at the, at the Manchester free trade hall. It's like, you think you're the only one that was there. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 but uh, that's not a very good analogy. Forget that. But you know, it's kind of like one of those things where you think it's just me, and that turns out that everyone's had the same experience, you know. And I hope I made that. Yeah. Point in the book. Yeah. It, it, start, you know. Yeah. There's some of those. You know, add you to the list, and all of those people, I suppose, at the back of the the, the, the spirit of talk talk book were probably in that club too. You know, who, who listened to it and had an epiphany. Yeah. There's. It's. It's like a kind of similar different you're in obviously different areas but there's that similar mm -hmm. of like whoa what the fuck is that it's always like whoa what was that oh it's that moment mm -hmm. of when that mm -hmm. guitar and then the mm -hmm. harmonica kicks in you're because it and just goes into that dun, dun, dun. Oh, so cool man Fucking yeah. love that shit. I, <laughs> loved, I loved what tim freeze group because tim the good thing about tim's answers is that he he was able to be quite um articulately poetic but he was also capable of just kind of being really zero in on the on the on the prosaic in in his interviews and he said uh um of the rainbow which i think is him playing the guitar he, he couldn't he's not really a guitarist and he only knew he allegedly only knew those two chords at the time <laughs> and he said yes yeah, it's, it's ripped off um steppenwolf's the pusher <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> yeah yeah i got that off steppenwolf's the pusher and i'm thinking <laughs> and you go back and it is like uh, 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 it's the same kind of like obviously the context is different so it doesn't really sound like that and similarly he was saying going back to it's getting late in the evening i love said, that song man that probably know this on the he said in the cab to the studio and i think i read this on one of his tweets in the cab to the studio um the dj the radio was on and it was like heart fm or something and the dj put on what a fool believes by the doobie <laughs> brothers michael mcdonald and um if you go back to listen to uh, that that little um, yeah. vap on the on the piano in uh, in in, in um, it's getting late in the evening. It's pure. It's straight out of what Full believes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great, except of course with the variophon and all the kind of the other um, production layers. It's a completely different experience. Yeah, Tim was telling me he can't use the variophon because it reminds him of Talk Talk too much. So yeah, well, I bet. Said, yeah, I mean, it's got a very halting quality anyway. I mean, I you know I think I compare it to those. You're probably you. You are definitely too young to remember, but that you know shows when I was a kid. There was this sort of slightly haunting, you know, pre-clangers. You might have heard of the clangers, oh, the but clangers like are creepy Pogles, shit, bro. Pogles Wood and Nog in the Nog, like <laughs> yeah. early early children's TV. There was creepy there was, shit, man. Early t children's TV, <laughs> wasn't it? Well, like... no, it was just Oliver Postgate. It was <laughs> lovely Oliver Postgate doing this sort of home animated weird shit in his farm, you know. <laughs> And it was one classical musician was making all this stuff with the, with the with clarinets and bassoons and things that, and that's where you know if you go on YouTube and listen to a little bit of Pogel's Word or something, it's like wow, this is a talk talk. <laughs> Pre talk talk, Mark's yeah. Mark's actual uh, <laughs> real inspiration. Actually, um, Tim's new record is really good. I, I told them it? it's, really, it's really good. I told them there was a. I'm a big fan of The Prisoner, you know, that, that uh, 60s TV mm. show. And mm. the Ron Grainer has these kind of little nuggets of, like, vibraphone stuff. Because the album, his album is literally vibraphone, melodica, drums, and a string section. Like that's, wow, I love vibraphone. Yeah, me too. And he was telling me how he, you know, set it up and we got deep into yeah. it. But anyways... Uh, I was say, he goes. I went back and I listened to Ron Ron Grainer after he said that to me, and he was like, "I didn't see it." Well, I'm paraphrasing, and I was like, "Yeah, but yeah. they're not on the soundtrack." I'm like trying to describe it. It's the little vibraphone parts, and I was like, oh, "Okay." But he was like, he said, "I'm not saying you're wrong." He said, "But it's cool to be like you know, 
to be, uh, you know, it's an honor, not an honor, but, you know, to be compared to someone like Ron Grainer. He's not going to take right. it as an insult, but yeah. I, yeah. I, I, there's just these little parts that I was trying to tell him on, on uh, The Prisoner, these subtle, like, parts of the, of the thing. It's but, very, I mean, there's something very, I suppose it, uh, uh, it's ch- the cheapest comparison. This is something very Austin Powers about a vibe. Of, <laughs> like the vibe. It's like vibes, isn't it? Like I'm thinking Milk Jackson and the modern jazz. Oh, group. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got some. I'm not. Yeah. I, I got, remember I got a jazz record before Milk Jackson when I was like, oh man, I'm not feeling this. I, I, I love jazz, but I was like, I oh. love I know Milk Jackson. Come on, I mean, not all of it. I agree. Not all it. of it. It was, a, it was. I went back and I was like, this, this can't hold me like that. And I was like, okay, I think it was just a record I got. And it was Mitch Jackson with someone else. I forget okay. the record, but 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 like okay. like, like I'm a I'm a fucking jazz head, so I was just like, okay. oh no, but yeah. <laughs> there's some great. There's, I'm trying to think of the guy on Blue Note. There's there's one vibes player who who released a lot of records on Blue Note, which is um, oh, I've got it up there on the shelf. I can't remember what it is, but it's like it's a, a really fantastic record. It's the yeah. Are you are you big jazz? So the, are you big jazz head? I do you know what I think I had a ja- I had a jazz epiphany about a year before starting the Talk Talk book, which was lucky, really. Wow, because that's I'm good. Pretty, yeah, <laughs> you know, I was I was not, you know, I had some some seventy stuff, some Headhunters. I was a big fan of, and and um, and I'm a good. lot of Jimmy Smith, but more the blues kind of, you know, song for my father. Big big oh, fan of that. Oh right, right. That's hard um, silver. More kind of blue, yeah, exactly. More sort of bluesy jazz, and and Grant Green, you know, guitar based stuff, that, that sort of thing. So I got I got a little bit more experimental. So some of the earlier Hancock records um like uh um, what's it called directions and moods or something yeah like yeah that. yeah yeah i'm going to see him in two weeks which is i'm really looking forward to seeing oh, it wow I've never seen him wow. live before never seen I, well did you see he was at glastonbury i they? seen so that on tv i was like that, is that was fucking great, yeah. cool man what a band yeah. like they were just tight as yeah, fuck that was brilliant that was, that was so good yeah have you heard um uh blue and sentimental by i quebec that's a fantastic record it's I a really that. mellow guitarist it, okay. It, it has such a vibe. Like a like guy had crazy story. Guy, you know, like the heroin addict and all that usual kind of jazz thing. Yeah, but like yeah, jazz died, story. It died super young, and you know that's what I love about jazz. Is like those. I had Ron Carter on the podcast. Who? Uh, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I had him on the oh, podcast. Amazing. He, I had him on maybe last year. Yeah, it was last year. That is was, so cool. Yeah, that was a really that was. Oh, I'm really, gonna go and listen to that. Yeah, that was a, that was an interesting one. Interesting, isn't it? Those old jazzers. There was a fantastic uh, interview in Mojo a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, with uh, Pharaoh Saunders. And you know, I think it was around, actually it was around the time of the of the Floating Points record. So right, you know, right. obviously you know back in in the public eye, and they were asking him about John Coltrane and Alice Coltrane and the whole you know the 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 whole scene and all that and his entire <laughs> his entire sort of approach to the thing or his memory of it was how much he got paid <laughs> it was all about that go, yeah you know i got to new york and that was great because uh you know i was finally getting paid and then you know the gig with uh <laughs> the gig with alice that was you know that was pretty that's pretty lucrative for me actually at that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, there's somebody who wants to talk about the great art that was being made. And it's all about for him. Bollocks. It's all about the dollars. Yeah, he's I love like, that. He's yeah. like, tell me, where's my money, baby? <laughs> yeah. But I think that's, you know, I mean, again, to you know, go back to, to blow my the book trumpet a bit, you know, I think that's a journalist. We love to sort of put this template of artistry and great, you know, dreaming music and Mm. I know that you know it's it happens and people feel it and there's an authenticity in some artists that 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 really feel it, but a lot of it you know is is superimposed over just some guys trying to make a living you know exactly, in the only yeah. way that they can, and um, that's kind of boring to write about <laughs> on whole you know oh yeah I got the gig with Lennon you know I did the Maraca part and then you know I love those those prosaic stories about session musicians who just go in and oh I was really you have to play it again well that's another that's another um, another hour and you're, you're going to have to put on the MU form you know all that. <laughs> great I love that you know because it's not all about the poetry it's it's no. about doing a job. Mm. Yeah, I think people kind of lose sight of that. Like, I, mm. I, lo- I love talking about music, but sometimes when I watch those, 
It's weird. I like shows about art, but I kind of tend to really dislike the people talking about it because they're all so poncy and shit. And you're like, mm. oh, dude, mm. shut up. Like, there was some, uh, oh, there was something odd. I think I was watching it. Maybe he was on Constable and this guy was like, like, an, oh, he wasn't so great, but I still, you know, like this typical, oh, it's like, bro, you shut the fuck up. And I find the people who actually make the art are the super cool people. It's the dudes that kind of talk about it are yes. like, you know Absolutely. what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe that's just my vibe. No, on it, I but. think it's a very. I mean, I'm doing a. Um, yeah, there's a there's a there's an academic conference actually later on this year, which is which is sort of because there's an awful lot of uh, discourse about pop music in in academia now. But it's but with regard to it, with regard to what like what what's, what's well, it's it's about main it's about mainstream music basically, and the fact that it, it uses just, the same I, chords. <laughs> Well, th- 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 there's a school of, you know, writing about pop music which started with a guy called Theodore Adorno, you might have heard of from the Frankfurt School in the 1940s, where which he wrote an essay called On Pop Music, which is basically lambasting oh. the pop music of the day, you know, Bix Bider Becker and, and Glenn Miller and sort of saying, well, it's either, you know, fast sort of music to, to forget your troubles you know he, he was convinced that it was all a kind of conspiracy against the proletariat it's marxist wow critic and uh, or it's or it's music to weep alone to you know so he had basically pop music is either dance your dance your ass off and forget your terrible job or stay at home and weep and listen to love songs and, and weep you know and actually reduced it to that and that thinking about pop music i think it's been been carried on you know to a point where in fact i have a book down here this book here, a book called Distinction, which is written by a, uh, a French kind of uh, music philosopher called Pierre Bourdieu. And he mm-hmm. kind of comes up with, um, he, ca- he came up with a term cultural capitalism okay. and how people, how people sort of, uh, um, you know, use their, in, their impressive knowledge of PJ Harvey and Nick Cave. <laughs> to make you feel small because you like Kylie Minogue. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm paraphrasing here. But he's, he's just as much as a sort of, you know, as a, as a, as a, a, of a snob as those people who wrote about Mark Hollis in the early, you know, in the yes. early period of Talk Talk. That's know. it, isn't it? And, it? and that's what's so fascinating is that for all of the <clears throat> art and the, and the, and the beautiful, stuff that we've been talking about you know with the rainbow and spirit of eden and laughing stock and the solo album you know he wasn't able to do those without the cash that came from it's my life and such a shame yeah and and actually you go on spotify and it's those songs are more popular than the rainbow and i know know, (laughs) laughing stock so you know what the fuck it's like it's pop music man don't have a go at it just because it's popular yeah, like the the I know this might say not weird, but I mean, it's easier to like, and for myself, like to like score stuff, you know, like I've done stuff for orchestras than it is to write like a three minute pop song that is. Interesting. You know what I mean? It's easier, like, because you can. It's easier to do complex stuff. Yeah. Because you can kind of go anywhere, but when yeah. you're in the pop world, you're you're defined by a set of this amount of people have to kind of like it. So Absolutely. once you put those yeah. limitations yeah. on yourself, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, a good thing. The, it's a good thing. Those people in the Brill building, you know, oh, Carol King, fucking amazing. Jerry Coffin, they're, ju- they're genius. It's absolute genius. Paul Simon, I think he worked there before. Bert Barrack. These, but yeah, these people are, you know, they are the artists. They are the true, the true authentic artists. Way more, way more than someone who, you know, maybe knows, um, you know, is it very well read and 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 decides yeah. that they want to make a record that sounds a bit like the Rolling Stones? And so <laughs> I won't have a go at Bobby Gillespie now. It's just, dude, don't get me started. Is he the guy from Primal Scream? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't worry. I there's a certain type of that whole scene. I'm not very familiar. I know them. But I can know them, but I'm not super. Familiar. I apologise for introducing Bobby Gillespie. <laughs> at this late stage it's uh yeah. i mean i i do think there's one band i know they're a bit later but they're horrendous they're called kasabian they're just oh just, god don't yeah they're, jesus they're Christ. on another level of like shit like if I, you I, want I, i'll send you a link to my i wrote all kind of one a one kind of mo- a monologue play about a bloke working in a record store uh, <laughs> and a bit during lockdown in a record store i'll send you a link to it but yeah Please do. Yeah, that's a, there's, a, there's my 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 feelings about the Sabian are, are in there. Yeah, it's funny though about like pop music. It's like 
you know, it's hard it, making something simple. But if you listen to like the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson stuff, that shit's incredibly complex, but sounds very simple. And that is mm. so genius. Mm. Like uh, the, Brian Wilson for me, I mm. love the Beatles. I love the Beatles. But Brian Wilson was for me. He was he was just there, and then mental issues you know fucked him yeah, up and you yeah, know it's yeah. sad because i always like thought man where could that guy go like mm. you know it's just i don't know that, that's my <laughs> yeah no it's you know that's the, that's the beauty of beauty of pop music i know i know are you big are you big huge pop fan still i, I know am. you, said, I know you huge... said in the book you were like into pop music i like i mean i you know i'm very i have very eclectic taste it's easy for me to say what i don't like you know um Kasabian. I don't don't like this lady. I don't like kind of, yeah, sort of pseudo intellectual kind of rock music. Although that said, I do like a lot of prog. You know, I like a lot of prog music, and and I like English whimsy, and I like you know German techno, and I yeah, this it's a, it's a shame. It's an addiction, really. I'm a terrible vinyl uh, junkie. So um, yeah, I've um, do you, yeah. still buy, do you still buy CDs? CDs are underrated, man. I well, buy they are underrated. Yes, really I are. buy. I <clears throat> because it's become increasingly hard to find uh, vinyl in charity shops. My and they, charity and they hack the price up. Like yeah, you used to get, so you used to be able to get yeah. stuff for like a euro, and now it's like ten quid. You're like, yeah, and they're coming well, off. They've, <laughs> they've just looked on Discogs at the most expensive kind of mint condition copy, yeah. and they're kind of old frisbee. You know, man, there's a great uh, Twitter. There's a great Twitter site called Vinyl Stupidity where people, oh, brilliant. people post ludicrously optimistic, you know, charity shop pricing on, you know, the sound of oh, bread. No. Fifteen quid for the sound of bread or, you know, Mantovani, seven pound fifty, this nonsense that goes on. But but no, in charity shops the, the, I mean some of the cannier ones have wised up, but you can get some great CD bargains. Generally, you know, there's records that were not originally released on CD. I mean, there's if, if clearly there's far too many Kasabian and Robbie Williams and Texas CDs in uh, uh, charity shops. But you know, occasionally you can find like a Pavement CD or a, or something more interesting that was not, yeah. or even you know, one of the uh, sort of sixties sixties or seventies bands that then got subsequently reissued on beautiful kind of artwork kind of uh packaging so yeah i do like cds what was the most surprising thing to you that you found out when you were re when you were writing the book and researching the book was there anything that you were like holy shit i never thought i realized i ever thought of that and it was just something new that you didn't know i'd say there was a oh, lot of things but was anything like that yeah out? just thinking of the. i mean i think the uh, i think the gulf was surprising <laughs> Because it was it came out of the blue. No one else had mentioned it, and I don't think he played golf with anyone else apart from Lawrence Pendrews, his 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 kids' um, music teacher at their school. Yeah. He, they, you know, he obviously got on on his final record. And just picturing Hollis going round this course, particularly it's this kind of celebrity. It was a it was a uh, can't remember. It's like a variety club type um, uh, situation, which is basically very potentially very expensive game of golf played at an excellent uh, golf club but made affordable because it's a special um uh actors guild that allows you and lawrence had managed to get a membership of this and mark kind of came along with him and i think mark was offered membership which absolute characteristically you know declined didn't want to be a member didn't want to be a member just wanted to be a guest and got and they and I think they had a they had a word about his trousers or something. He was wearing jeans, you know. And they said, "Oh no, you should you've got to, you've got to wear a kind of smarter trouser." And he was, you know, you can imagine what because he always, he always had a chip on his shoulder about having long hair at school and you know yeah. having to dress right. So he didn't like that. But um, yeah, I just thought that was amazing, you know, that he was a, that he would uh, go around the golf course. Less surprising that he would the conversations that he and Lawrence should have. But I think he was definitely quite, you know, he was quite a competitive player. And he liked, he played football, obviously. That was not a surprise because I think a lot of musicians are like yeah. a kicker. You know, yeah, I think most the people... Golf was, yeah, just the, just the idea of this, of this, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the cliche of him being this hermetic <laughs> figure who, who is, who, uh, bearing his soul on, um, on, 
on on a succession of records which are you know getting increasingly uh esoteric should then you know in the middle of those just be teeing off and um you know shouting for or whatever you do when you play golf i thought, I thought that was great you know it's like imagining pj harvey you know doing or something you never know but anyway I better, I better let you go man because I know you're busy and you got things to do but man like thanks so much for doing this uh, oh, it's been an absolute pleasure really yes. really enjoyed it I'm sure we could talk for many more hours but life prevails <laughs> but um, man I love that book it's fucking class Great. I'm glad you, I'm glad you like I, it I've been telling all my friends who are talk talk fans There's not many just a few I've, I'm trying to convert more people but I think it's, it's happening time. organically I think yeah. it seems to be yeah I'm always surprised how young people are who who are, who are excited about it. You know, the sort of ex-girlfriends of mine have been ringing me up and saying that their eighteen-year-old sons are getting excited. About really? It. Yeah, amazing. That's class. Um, That's class. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks very much. The book is it's fantastic. I I I, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I remember reading the 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 final part of it. I think I read for like five hours. I was doing a bus journey, and I was like, "Oh man, fucking yeah!" That's always a sign of a good book because you know some books you're like. You're like, I'm gonna read this book, and you're like, oh, yeah, you're you kind of, it, yeah. yeah, you're you're pushing yourself. Though some books that you're not <laughs> like, you go, I don't know why, but you're like, oh, I'll just, I'll do fifty pages, and you get to thirty, like, mm, I'll do like twenty, <laughs> you know. It's like, but but that book, I'm not trying to lick your arse. I I thought it was really, it was really well, well, it was really well written, and like, oh man, uh, oh, thank you so much. That's, and, that's, that's lovely. Yeah, paints a good picture, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So thank you very much, and thanks for doing this, and. Yeah, man. It's been, we'll, it's been a pleasure. We'll do, we, we'll do it again sometime when, if you can ever want to do it again. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. Well, let's hope, you know, let's hope I, I, I find an equally interesting thing to write yeah, about. Yeah, man. I, I, actually, you're working on it before, before I go. And how do people reach you? How can they get the book? Da, 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 da. Uh, well, people can get the book with um, just simply typing in markhollis.com, which takes them to the Rocket 88. Um, page where they can buy it online uh i think some branches of waterstones have it if they bought it directly from the wholesaler they tend to my publishers tend to avoid going into retail places like amazon for example who uh demand a big discount and then they don't make any money um ah, and it seems to be nice. the business model seems to be working for them because yeah most people are being yeah they're just buying it online and you get a little i think you get a discount um online as well you know it's more i think yeah the, the main hardback is like 40 quid in the shop so i think it's 35 on the sweet on the man. yeah sweet. Thank hey thanks man for doing this fantastic have a lovely evening you cheers too, brother cheers. Bye, bye bye, bye.